Good morning, everybody. I'll just wait for people to join here. Started a little later um, just to observe the silence for our frontline workers who've unfortunately passed away over the last few weeks. So I just thought I'd take a, take a moment myself to observe that too. So hopefully you guys are going to join us on a wee walk today. Um, we'll be getting going in a little moment. I thought I'd take this chance just to sit here in Moat Wood uh, while everybody joins us. So check on in, let us know where you're watching from. Uh, all the regulars, let's have, give us a roll call and uh, we'll give you a shout out. And we'll do a wee introduction of sort of what, what we're doing today. I've got a few props with me just to sort of give some orientation. And uh, we're mainly going to be exploring quite a sort of localised area today. It's going to be all about the moat wood and the mott. Um, so we'll pick up a few other things along the way um, and of course all your questions so do do ask. Good morning Hannah and uh, I'll do my best to answer them. Now I'll, there's a little caveat to today in that I forgot my little crib sheet which has all of the historic dates and names of the various kings and lords and so on that, that occupied the mot up here um, during the Anglo-Norman time. So I'm going to do my best to try and remember this from just off the cuff. Um, I do have a couple of resources with me but they're limited um, but I totally forgot my suit so I'm sorry that. So what, what I'll do is after the live stream um, I'll make sure I post all the, the information out there for, for those of you who really like the you know the sort of the, the detail in the in the history um, I'll make sure it's there. We'll just get an arrive in there which is great to see you all. Good morning Violet. Good morning Jane. Hey, Gillian hello. Barbara good to have you along. Maybe good morning, Alison. Good morning. Good to see all you regulars joining us. And Sharon, good morning. So not far off getting ready soon. The sun has just come out. Um, just sat next to this lovely little patch of bluebells. They're just starting to get about a week away from their best. I put a few clips out yesterday um, on Twitter and Instagram um, of the bluebells. I haven't put anything on Facebook yet, but I'll put a few bits up later this week just as a teaser because I mean they're still still a little way off and you see they're only just starting to open the lower bells at the moment so I want to make sure that we get a real good hit with the uh, with the coverage so we'll, we'll, we'll start looking at start off just by getting a bit of orientation so I brought the two maps along um, some of you will recognize this one from previous live streams so, so this is the 1920s OS with the, the Vista uh, views on. I've also got our, our other one, which has all the field names and, and woodland names on it, which is quite cool as well. So we'll kick off just with the uh, the 1920s one, just because this, this is the map that we're working to as we're restoring all the rides and trails around the estate. So the, the higher um, scale one of these is, is really got some good information on it. But we're basically sat, I'm sat just about here at the moment in Moat Hill, and you can see the Mott um, is marked on the 1920s OS map here. And uh, just, if I just get through the book here, if I can remember where I put the markers, there we go. Do -do -do. Nope, I have, I've lost a marker, but I'll just see if I can find it. Okay, here we go. So we're going to be swinging by the mot. Um, so this is part of our uh, conservation management plan that documents all of the various historical features and this, that and the other in there. This particular one is um, the, the appendix for it. It has about 50 pages of just about the gates. <laughs> that's it. So that's the sort of detail we're going on to um, in, in some of our, our sort of study documents and that's what we work from. Um, but the mot itself is, is obviously predates the domain as we know it today. Um, so it's a, an 11th century slash 12th century mot. So this is Anglo-Norman. Um, anybody who's familiar with these things, quite a few of them dotted across uh, Ulster area and, and the east coast of the island and island as a whole. Um, and they were basically, some of them were sort of fort fortified um, sort of settlements as they were. They would have a, a, a little sort of 
timber building on the top and, and a bailey so you hear the mott and bailey would have been outside now this particular one is only the mott um, so again apologies because i haven't got all my information here with me i left a sheet at base so i will get that one out um, i'll put it in the comments at the end of the live stream um, so so if anybody really knows your mots feel free to correct me on anything as as i go through this but we're going to go visit it in a moment um, so, so yeah, it, it, it's basically they, they were a combination of, of a visual statement within the landscape as well as uh, sort of a, a fortified um, stronghold. They were basically mainly expensive, so they're incredibly hard to actually get into. So you'll get an idea of this when we actually go to the uh, mot itself. I thought I'd take an indirect route just to sort of pass through some of the woodlands here because the, the woodland flora is really coming out now. So just see who else has checked in here. Who have we got joined us? Heather, good morning. Helen, good morning. Alf and Wynne Win as well, hello. And we've got another Heather. Lisa's back, she missed a week but joining us this week. Brilliant, Jenny's back. Lynn, good morning, and Sharon, good morning. So, I'm really glad the sun has just come out, because it was an incredibly cold morning today. Um, and I was worried that we wouldn't see some of the insects that I'm hoping to see here, because um, the main reason I'm visiting the Mots here today is, is not just for its historical interest, but because we're managing the site purely for biodiversity. So whilst it is a archaeological and historical sites and um, it provides a really good opportunity to, to actually manage specific habitats for uh, certain groups of insects uh, mainly because it sits in the middle of the woodland here uh, I'm just going to correct the there we go level again mainly because it sits in the middle of the woodland here um, so quite sheltered and effectively it creates this woodland glade habitat so Nicely sheltered from the wind, total sun trap here. And it's been absolutely amazing for a lot of the mining bee species, which you've heard me ramble about over the past few weeks. Um, and all sorts of other pollinators and, and goodies. And we should start seeing some of the speckled wood butterflies out here soon as well. And there's a special um, type of moth that we've recorded here in the woodlands. It's, it's sort of localized, but it's called the lunar hornet moth. Now, it, a lot of moths have mimicry um, as their kind of disguise, as it were. And this one disguises itself and it looks like a very large hornet. Um, but it's totally harmless, but incredible mimicry. I've, I've, we had um, a chap who managed to record some photos on here. I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but I'll, he gave us permission to share his images. So I'll, I'll put one of those in the comments as well after the live stream. Um, credit him as well, of course. Uh, quite an impressive, impressive little thing. So, we're here at the Mott, and uh, it's quite a big structure. So it's it's about 22 metres in diameter. That's just the mound. The um, the ditch itself is, is about 4 metres wide and 2 metres deep. Um, it would have been deeper in the time, and uh, would have had uh, the proverbial like ankle snapper at the bottom of it. So this is what made these things so defensive, uh, incredibly well defended. So you'd have like the keep on the top. We're going to go up there in a moment. Um, so basically, in terms of you def were defending an area, you can fall back to here. Anyone who was trying to get into these sites would have to go down a two-meter ditch with a like a, a stone-lined ankle snapper at the bottom, and then try and get up a uh, eight-meter high mound. All the way up there and of course this is whilst you're getting things thrown and shot at you all the time as well so that's why they were so successful and they were modeled on um, an actual pre-christian design of, of, of a fortified village called a rath and we have one of those on the state as well um, so they would have been a bit smaller a bit wider but with with this classic moat around it um, there's a really good um, example of this including structures that were built on and around it in um, Navan, the Navan Fort, um, so which county is that? That's one of the western ones, I forget which one. Um, someone's, if anyone's been there, let us know. And uh, of course, what you would have had is, on a lot of these, if it was a bailey, you would have had a sort of a lower building here with a 
timber walkway behind so you'd have this sort of sequence of defensive fullbacks each time and the main top of the mot itself would have had a big timber palisade all the way around it um, so think big stakes with spikes on the top you know carved into a, 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 a so someone's trying to call me i'm going to decline that one okay <laughs> I did put it on do not disturb but for some reason someone's calling me there we go okay so now we'll carry on round here a minute and uh, just check in your comments so yeah keep some questions coming in i'll pick up some of those um on my way through here um julianne has already asked uh, i'm looking for some bluebells it's my dad's first anniversary and he loves bluebells and wanted to get some for the growth tomorrow is there any way to get them from mount stuart so I'd have to say no, and I'll tell you why, is because bluebells are a protected species. Um, it's illegal to lift, move, destroy them. Um, there are some licensed commercial growers um, around. Uh, I don't know any off the top of my head, I'm afraid, but um, hopefully you'll be able to find them. And of course you can buy the bulbs of uh, bluebells from licensed growers. So so hopefully, hopefully that'll answer your question, Julie. Lisa's been to the Navin Fort, there we go, it's in Armagh. Thank you, thank you, Lisa. Okay, and Jane's just said as well, brilliant. <laughs> See, this is really useful having an audience on these things because it helps keep me right and I can, I can never remember everything. So, so okay, so this is a, a an archeological site here. It's it's a scheduled site, so it's it has um, legal protection. So it has a 10 meter buffer zone around it where basically it would be illegal to break ground or disturb the ground in any way or form because of its historical status um, but equally enough uh, with those provisions and protections on it means that you as the landowner you can't allow it to degrade either so what was happening here is when we took ownership of, of the wider domain um, this particular area of woodland has been leased to the uh, forestry service for a while and it's had the commercial uh, plantation on it it's now been replanted with uh, mostly oak um, but what had happened in this site is just over the years it's sort of been forgotten and there was a huge amount of scrubby plant growth coming up so there was a uh, sycamore had, had really sort of grown all the way up the slope here just where the the gorse is coming up here was uh, mostly um, laurel so another invasive species had made its way in around here I mean it would be you know a certain amount of plant colonization has happened but of course it has those protections so it needs to make making sure that we're we're obviously adhering to them and of course it, it totally hid the sheer scale and scope of this and it's a particularly good example of a lot I'm going to step back here to try and get it all in frame um, it's a very good example structurally speaking a lot of moths um, that still exist today um, They've degraded, so they may have slumped, or there's there's damage to the overall sort of earth workings. But this one is so good that when we go up on top, you can actually see that the, the mound that rings the very top of it as well, that the timber palisade would have sat in. Um, so it sits quite high up on on the sort of the scheduling status. Uh, so in I think it was it winter 2017, I think it was. Um, the trusty team of Ranger Volunteers and, and, our, and ourselves, we started the process of clearing the site of the, the vegetation. So it was getting to the stage where these these particular trees that seeded themselves into it, they were going to start actually coming out. And as they pulled themselves over, they were ripping chunks of the, the mound out of it. So, so we had to do something about that. So it was a, a complete clearance of the entire uh, structure except for four trees that I've left. And I'll tell you about those in a little minute when we go up top. Um, so, so not only was there invasive species here, um, you also had all of the tree stock damage in the actual structure itself. So it all has to be done by hand. So you can't have any mechanical implements, um, you know, timber grabs or anything like that in here as, as part of the scheduling. So, so it was literally, this entire site was done by hand, and it's a big site. Now it took the better part of, sort of three or four months to do the, uh, the entire structure. Um, and then we went into the uh, depths there, all the way up the top, extracting by hands. But there was so much timber that came out. Um, we, well, what were we going to do with it? We couldn't get it all out, we couldn't bring chipper in to chip it. 
uh, but what we did do, and it's worked out quite well, you can just sort of see this, we used a lot of the timber to line the edge of the mop all the way around here, so not only has it created a really nice deadwood habitat all the way around, when we initially cleared this it looked pretty cool too. Um, so there's a few pictures I put up in the little event listing for today. Um, I'll, again, I'll, I'll try and add a few more of these pictures into the comments of um, the live stream afterwards. So, so yeah, so it's like a win-win situation where we're clearing the invasive species, protecting the the historical structure, creating more deadwood habitat, and So, just pick up a few questions. I think I'm on the uh, low side of the mot here, which, there we go. The low side of the mot here, which it sits. So, this is north behind me, south over, over there, of course. Um, and just for orientation, I'll switch the camera back around. It's going to turn around for me. Everybody wants to look at me. There we go. Um, the farm is out through there, so we'll pop out there just for um, orientation a little bit. Um, so, We've got now got lovely multiple faces of suns. So we've got east face, west face, north face, south face, and all the different insects like those different temperatures that sit here. So, like, so here on the north face, we've got lots of primrose. There's absolutely thriving and ferns and all sorts of things because they sit in that slightly damper side of the mot itself. And then you go round into the other faces and you've got carpets of the, the dog violets uh, coming up. There's lovely banks of rose bay willow herb, a nice bit of uh, brambly scrub here. And of course, with that comes a lot of these mining bee species as well. So we've got, I'm just coming up to it and I'm hoping they've started because I know, I think every live stream we've done so far, we've not actually been able to see any because <laughs> they haven't started yet. And it has been pretty cold this morning, but this little bare patch of ground here has always been pretty good for, and yes, there we go, there's one right there. You can see, oh, there it goes. We'll see if we can get into land again. Um, but these little solitary mining bee species are loving the, these little bare patches. There's, there's another one. So I'm hoping you guys can see that. I'm not gonna poke, point my finger at it, but it's right in the middle of the screen there at the moment. You can just see that. Don't know what the quality is like. These are tiny, they're about sort of five or six mil long. Uh, so what's that uh, in, in Imperial? Uh, it's like less than quarter of an inch, I think that would work out as. And of course, you've got all of these lovely banked bare patches of soil, tusky grass, and, and these have been fantastic homes for you know all, all of these species that previously was just totally rank and covered up. So it, it's it's been really quite beneficial to sort of see this site evolve over the last what, three, four years now? Three, three years, yeah. Um, so, yeah, has anybody else seen any, since I've been sort of pointing these things out over the last few weeks, has anybody seen any of these sort of solitary bees in their gardens at home? I'd love, love to know. I'll just pick up back through the comments here a little bit. So here we've got... Uh, Heather was asking, how old is it? So this is 11th century. So, so this is like the 1200s. Um, so Anglo-Norman mott. I'll get all the information up um, after the live stream, sort of the details of the who's and the what's. And we can actually place, um, I think it's William de Lacey is the, the, the lord or the landlord that, that, that sort of had his seat at this particular area. And we've got, Andrew's asking where's the top down glasses. Oh, I forgot them, sorry. <laughs> Good morning, Doris. Pick up. Heather says they've also been to Navenfort and they used to roll the Easter eggs down it. Brilliant. Or did they have a little event there? That sounds quite fun. So we, we, we haven't got access up onto the top of this for visitors yet. Um, we've got a few things running in the background that, you know, in, in the best case world, if, if you know, resources had allowed it, we'd, we would love to try and recreate the, the actual timber uh, walkway 
that would have gone up onto it so we can one afford access for people up onto the top but also it's very historically fitting so one day we might get to that point Kara says we live right beside uh, Donagadima yeah so Donagadima and that one has a bailey or had a bailey with it as well if I remember right it's quite a large one too isn't it yeah just behind the the, the main run there there's there's a lot of these peppered across the, the whole of the east coast of the island of Ireland um, many of them have unfortunately sort of been destroyed over the years but there's thankfully most of them have protections now um, and it's a real curiosity here in the woodlands of, of Mount Stewart now interestingly this you know I've talked about the the views and the vistas of, of the design landscape at Mount Stewart and you'd think well up top of there would that be a perfect view and vista but it's it was never incorporated into the design landscape and um, from everything that we can see there was no sort of dedicated trails that led to it they only led around it and um, so the closest trails actually just out over there but it was certainly a curiosity within the landscape here that that um sort of visitors and the family would have would have come to um, yeah it's, it's just strange i just stood here so i've moved around to um the which way we're we facing so south north so west, yeah, so we're on the west side at the moment and we've got these beautiful carpets of uh, various dog violets. So these are, let's just check the back of them. So it has a little white, see this little bit here? This is the, the white bit. So this is the common dog violet. Um, uh, there's a really good guide on, on the violets. So there's lots of different, so these are basically pansies. Um, you do get wild pansies, there's the field pansy, uh, viola tricolour. Um, but these are classic little woodland and woodland glade flowers, beautiful, very early flowering. So you have common dog violet, early dog violet, I think is the one that has the the purple back to it, off the top of my head. And of course, got some bluebells there too, lovely ferns coming up. And it, you know you can start to see how this mosaic of, of sort of levels of the grass and different densities of vegetation start to really knit together an interesting habitat. So I think without further ado, it might be time to try and get on up there. So so you guys are my uh, lone working um, control. Um, so if something happens to me, please alert the uh, services. Obviously, you've got to be very careful here, of course. Um, but this kind of alludes to why um, this is quite a difficult site to manage because it is so steep. So, you know, we need to manage the vegetation on this particular um, site. So it's it's just about kind of right at the moment. But of course, if, if we leave it untouched, we'll just have more, the trees will grow up again um, and it'll get overly rank again. So we want to try and strike this balance with how we manage this in, over the coming years. We'd love to introduce grazing onto this site. So um, three guesses what what animal we'd like to use on here, given that it's very steep slopes. Um, let me know in the comments and then I'll come back to that. David's just signed in, he's watching, he was one of our volunteers and he remembers it well. It was it was an interesting challenge, there was mock fatigue after a while because it took so long, but we had support from great uh, corporate groups coming in as well, helping us too. Lisa says, yeah, it was amazing to see a lot of hard work. It was, it was, um, but I mean, we're really lucky that we have an amazing team of people that, that, that support and help our work here. Now, I'm just going to be quiet. I don't know whether you can hear this, but it is absolutely buzzing around me. I can hear nothing but solitary bee flies. I can hear some drone flies, bumbles. Um, Can you hear that? Maybe not. But th this is this, because this bank here, this is full of all those solitary bee, bee holes. Um, can you see all the little holes? There's one. hand 
Um, you know, the only realistic way to do that is with the likes of sort of a flail or, or a strimmer. We can't really do that, and working on a slope with a, a large spinning implement isn't the most uh, operational safe uh, thing to do. So that's why we're thinking about grazing here. So does anybody, let's see if anybody's put in the comments uh, what they're thinking. <laughs> Andrew says, Grace comes, ha ah, you're very funny. <laughs> so goats, yep, Jane, well done. Heather, Ricky, Tim, well done, yep. So goats would be the perfect ones to get on here. They, they eat everything, so they would They'd hit the, the thornier um, scrub growth as well as the grassier stuff. They'd even nibble down the likes of the uh, gorse here as well. So what we'd like to do eventually is, you know, talking maybe three, three or four weeks, once a year, you know, five or ten uh, goats on this site, we'll just uh, bring that, that vegetation down and just keep it in check enough to sort of hold this site as this sort of glade uh, that we've got here. This is quite a sight and, and the woodland around us here is it's just, it's just starting to come up but we can still see a quite a good view over towards the farm from here and I'm going to go stand on this stump so we're going to see over the top and there are so many so many solitary bees here and they're so small as well <laughs> I don't think the, the camera on the live stream doesn't tend to pick them up but let's have a look. There we are. Okay. So, a bit of orientation for you. Farm is there. This is Bean Hill, which, interestingly enough, was going to be the site of the house, uh, Mount Stewart House originally, but the instant, in the end, they extended the plantation house, which is Mount Stewart House as you know it today. So the gardens are just behind this line of trees here. But it's a lovely day here. The, the birds are singing away. <laughs> Heather was asking where the bumblebees live. So they are lots of different species. There's 16 different species of bumblebee on the island of Ireland. Um, they all live in sort of different types of habitats, but the bumbles they particularly like um, this sort of habitat here. A little bit of dead wood, maybe a little a little hollow in underneath there maybe. Some of this lovely nice tussocky grass with their, as you can see it's quite dead and crispy. They might make their little small hives in there. So when we say a hive, you know, most of these species of, of bee, you're talking maybe 10, 10 to 20, maybe even 30 cells, um, you know, the, the combs of the cells. That would be it, That that is the hive. Um, it's only the honeybee that makes the, the big, you know, the big, big hives. Um, and that's just one species, of course. But Anne, Anne says you can't, can't hear me. Can't hear anything since you got on top. Oh dear. Let me see. Can everybody hear me now? Is that, is that working now, is it? I'm hoping I've not put it on mute. Let me know if, if the sound comes back on you. It might be because the, um, just as I was climbing up the slope, the uh, our signal was totally blocked. So hopefully that's back now. Sounds okay for everyone. Okay, that's good. Sorry about that. These technical issues, uh, they've been going fairly well so far, so I'm kind of glad that we're... <laughs> <laughs> Very good. So, so what was I talking about then when the sound cut out and when did it come back in? I was answering Heather's question about bumblebees. Right. So, well just in the meantime I'll, I'll just go up to the edge. So you can see we've got, you know, there's, there's birch trees regrowing in here so there's another reason to get that grazing back. There we are. So I'm, I'm right on the edge here, and so since the grass has come up, it's a little hard to see. But if you can just make out, you can make out this sort of mound just here, and then it drops away. You've then got the sort of the main sort of dish where the keep would have been up the top here. 
It's a little windier up here, so yeah, there might be a little bit of uh, wind noise. There we go. I mean, it must have just been a couple of people who lost the sound. Most people are saying that they've had sound all the way through there, so that's okay. But I mean, it's... I can hear the cattle uh, mooing away over there, it's quite nice. So, so we cleared obviously all the vegetation that had established on here, and we needed to keep our options open for how we manage this. So, you know, I talked about the, the need that we ideally want to get grazing on here. One, because they're far better at it than, than humans are for managing vegetation. So, yeah, goats would be fantastic. Um, but we also need to keep our options open if we do need to do any work on the slopes. I mean, effectively, that's, you know, it's a pretty steep slope. You know, we're talking 60, 65 degree slope. Um, so working on slopes is the same, almost the same legislation as working on height, working from height. So, you know, for, for, for more than a single sort of pass up, pass down the slope, what you're looking at is needing to have ropes uh, support. So, you know, an anchor basically, so you don't fall down the, the circa 20 meter drop that's down there. So, so this is why we kept a number of living trees and I kept some of these stumps here slightly higher. So Heather was asking when we cut down the trees, do we put something down to kill the roots? Yeah, so we, we do use the same um, glyphosate based uh, herbicide um, to paint onto the stumps. So the same ones that we use for the likes of rhododendron and laurel and, and Japanese knotweed. And it pretty much gives a 99% sort of kill in that first year. And then when we basically up, we just mop up anything else that's, that's left. So it means that we don't have to spray it, which is great. So we're just using a paintbrush just to paint it on the stumps. Um, so it really limits its usage, which is always good. So would goats make tracks on the slopes? So they shouldn't do. Um, again, there's, there's some quite thick vegetation here. I might just step off the side a tiny bit because it is a bit windy up top, amazingly. So hopefully you guys step into the... Uh, there we go. Hopefully the wind noise has stopped there now. So, um, if we kept them on here all year round, they would start to make tracks and, and sort of um, maybe start poaching the ground a little bit. So that's why I'd say, you know, three to six weeks, five to ten animals on here would be about right. And of course, you know, if, if, if say it was a mild winter like it was uh, just this winter gone, You'd probably want to actually keep them on maybe a bit longer or even have them on in two stints during the year um, because the grass was growing all winter. Um, and equally enough, if it's quite a harsh winter and grass growth has slowed or stopped, then we probably have a little less out on the ground as well. So yeah, um, I suppose the other thing is, is goats don't tend to walk in the same areas all the time. So sheep classically make you know, those, those trails in the field where they just walk the same route all the time. Uh, so that's another benefit to goats as well, as well as the, the fact that they eat everything. <laughs> so, um, back to those tree stumps. Yeah, so ropes access. So, so those living and dead tree stumps, they'll, if we need to, they'll be our ropes access anchor points. So when we have a rope and harness for doing any extended work on the slope, if we, if we have to. Um, so if I'd have got rid of all of these, and we wouldn't have had anything to uh, <laughs> anchor anything to. Um, or we would have had to like uh, bang a stake into the ground, which would be a breach of the protected, um, so the, the legislation that protects this site. Um, so, so yeah, ho hopefully we'll be able to get grazing in here, and I won't have to sort of rope ourselves up and up and down the the slope. Um, but it'll be good. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of looking forward to. It. I mean, it's a, it's a fantastic little site. So this is on the green trail, uh, just for anyone who maybe hasn't been out to this, this location yet. Uh, so when we're back open again, um, come by the trailhead, uh, meet Barry or David or Nick, um, and, and ask about the mott, and they'll point you in the right direction. Uh, it's, it's, it's impossible to get lost to Mount Stewart, it's a wall domain. So basically if you climb a fence or go over a wall, you really can't. <laughs> I'm just going to climb back down here again because it's so windy up top. We're going to look at a couple of other things to uh, sort of see see the signs of what's been about. Before I go falling flat on my face. Oh, wild raspberry, just about to burst into flower. 
There you go. That'll be good for a lot of the autumn, the late summer and autumn butterflies that like to uh, feed on fruit, uh, like the uh, peacock and red admirals. They like sucking on the sort of the overripe fruits. Of course, the birds do as well. Now I'm in the, the little buzzy hollow here again. <laughs> so, as always, I may have missed the odd question here and there, and I'll, I'll, I'll make sure I look through the comments after the live stream just to pick anything up that I've missed. And oh, there's all these fresh burrows here. Can you see all the fresh earth? It's been, this, there's a hole just here, there's a hole there. Okay, it's not the most riveting of footage, but... So what I'm going to do now is um, I'm going to take a stroll See if I can find um, a couple of the willow stumps and the willow trees. I think there's a few just around the corner here. Um, so I was talking earlier on about the the lunar hornet moth. Um, so this is a moth species that it lays its eggs at the base of willow trees. So willow trees are its food plant and its host plant. And the larvae will uh, basically sort of live inside for the year, make these sort of burrows up and down inside the tree itself. Um, and then around, I think it's late May, early June, the, they pupate and they emerge as adults. Uh, and the males emerge first. They're the ones that have the, the sort of most uh, quite profound mimicry, looking like the, looking like hornets. And then the females will come out uh, not not long after. And more often than not, because um, moths work from pheromones, so the female will give off its pheromone just to let us know it's there. And the males will smell that on the air with their amazing antennae and uh, find the female and more often than not the female has literally just popped out um, hatched out of the tree and within anything like from a couple of minutes it's usually mated and is laying its eggs there straight away and um, so quite often the female never even leaves the tree uh, that it was uh, laid into originally um, they're, they're quite interesting little little uh, species I've just spotted an orange tip butterfly. Ooh, it's a male orange tip there. Just working its way through. Very busy. He'll be patrolling his territory. I can probably stand here. He's just over there at the moment. And it'll do a loop and come back round. So it may be literally just patrolling around and around the, uh, the mot here as its little breeding territory. I haven't seen a speckled wood yet though. There's lots of uh, these march flies um, with the big long legs, and I think I remember seeing someone saying the Loch Ness flies are all out and about now as well. Uh, so just in time for the swallows arriving. Uh, that's one of their big food sources, little small flies, midges, and things like that in the air. Of course, bats will eat them too. So Becky says, from a safety viewpoint, what three words gives you an exact location of where you are? Oh yeah, <laughs> that the, yeah. What three words? So what what were they, um, Becky? Do you want to see if you see if you can get online for the mutt? You know where the mutt is. That'll be interesting to see what it comes up with. <laughs> so. Just looking for some of the willow here at the moment. I'm going to see if we can find these these old um, holes where the the moth has actually hatched out the tree. So the, these these holes are called. Um, and we might be able to find some of the the one. In fact, there we go. And this wasn't planned because I haven't ever been to this particular tree before. And um, look at that. There we go. And we're back. Sorry, that's lost. I can't lay down on the ground. <laughs> apparently. No, I knew you. Usually got really good signal here, but it seems to be a little poor today. Um, well, well, we'll see what we can do. So basically, just in front of us here is, is a, a willow, crack willow. And just at the base here, I've spotted a couple of exuvay holes. So these are the holes that the... Um, 
push the signal too far. Um, it does seem to keep cutting out. There we go. Right, so I've got two bars now. There we go. So over there, the hut, I can't get near it because there's no signal there. Um, there's this willow over there, um, and that's where the, the lunar moths have been hatching out of before. So I'll get some pictures up in the comments. Um, It's uh, it's a bit patchy to say the least. Um, I don't know what's going on there. Maybe the I can't remember what the state of the tide is. The signal on the estate is is impacted by whether the tide is in or, or out in the lock. Um, I can't remember which way round it is. It's whether the the water reflects the signal and bounces it around, or whether it's the mud that absorbs it. One of the two. Um, but anyway, um, so we're just here at the the edge of the green trail. So this is one of the the loop routes that passes around the mott and uh, looking out towards the farm um, last week's live stream when we were going around the ghost ponds that's the elm tree just there um, you know, a cracking elm tree we've got, we've got one of our tenants uh, some of the cows are in the pasture now um, but this is where the next phase of the trails are going to open um, now, because the work obviously has stopped currently, um, we've still got a few more bits and pieces to do, but it's not regarded as essential work. Um, so I'm not sure whether we're going to have it open immediately when we do reopen, but I'd like to think that we'll have it open this year. Um, there's, there's maybe one or two weeks worth left on, on just tying in the end of the trails, but, but this is where it will, will connect into our south trails, and it basically passes along the entire screen all the way over past Carrickwood to the very northeast corner in the flush field and then joins in uh, past Fort Hill which is where the Rath is and then ties into the North Rye trails uh, that was, uh, la was it last year's yeah last year's trails that we opened um, are, are over there so you'll be able to do a full perimeter walk of the estate and it's um, it's, it's uh, was it 6.57 miles I can't remember what it is um, but I mean that's a good old stomp. I think it works out as like 9.5k, so not far off a, a good 10k run. Um, so if you sort of maybe did a circle at the start or the finish and you get your 10k in for the for the day for, for those you are runners. <laughs> there we go. So yeah, sorry about everyone, that little bit of signal uh, that went a bit funny there. I'm going to head back round to the other side now. Um, it should be a bit better on that side, but it's okay if I stay sold but maybe not so great if I'm moving around on this little dead zone so I'd say this would probably this is probably it for today actually it was just a, a short and sweet um live stream from today so if you've got any other questions pop them for a little while once I get back to base so give me give me about 20 minutes to get back to base and I'll jump on the comments and get some some of that historical date information up about the uh, mot itself and uh, and any other questions you've got, please do ask. Becky is saying the big tree stump you were standing on was branch. Oh, this is so. This is the what three words was branch and elevate dock, and in the middle ish was indicated corkscrew scorpions. <laughs> there we go. So so yeah. So if 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 I was had had have done myself in, it comes across the lock. Okay. <laughs> So yeah, I'm just going to finish up by um, strolling back through um, moat wood, this young young oak replant. And we've got a lovely uh, section of wet woodland here, which is full of, full of more of the willow that's in there. And that's again, that's that host plant for that uh, uh, lunar hornet moth. I had just one lonely moth in the moth trap this morning. It was a nut tree tussock, um, one of the very fluffy moth species. Uh, and we're back. Right, so there we go. So yeah, really bad signal today. Um, in the mic, it's normally really good here. So I'll I'll uh, sign off for today. 
I hope you enjoyed just this little short one today um, and I'll jump on the comments in about 20 minutes and, and get some more information up here. I'll leave you with uh, the robin just singing up the way up there. So I will see you in the Mount Stewart Moment daily, daily clips and we've got some stuff coming up from uh, Tim at our um, propagation and gardens nursery area over the next uh, couple of days and hopefully next live stream one's that that's Tuesday the 5th is it um, is back at the the formal gardens with with one of the gardens team as well so you've got a few things uh, lined up um, and again let us know if you have any suggestions for any of the other live streams, bear in mind that I've got this whole issue with signal on the estate, um, and equally enough, any of the clips or anything you want me to take a close look at over the coming weeks. Um, it's certainly looking like this is going to carry on in one form or another until mid May at the very earliest, um, and even then, you know, when things are eased, we may not be open straight away. Uh, so, we do need to make sure that we've got everything in line first. So, thank you, everybody. Um, and I'll see you all next week.